20th Century Fox thought Alien 3 was going to be huge by name recognition alone. Only David Fincher seemed to know what the hell was going on because he said rightly what most sci-fi fans understood as a given at the time. This movie isn't made for people who see a movie one time. It's a movie for people who are going to see it five times. Fincher, stressed, full of doubt, and worn out before the film's release, showed the work print to Joel Schumacher to get his opinion. Schumacher told Fincher, the movie is okay. He said Fincher was an overachiever, so he would be disappointed. But the problem was that he actually cared about the movie, and that the studio didn't. And that was the real problem with the movie. Regardless, Fox had its product and verified how out of touch they were when they marketed this dark gothic movie with a little girl being autopsied and a man being churned by a fan by making a Pepsi commercial with teens giving a Pepsi to a nice alien. They even tried to enter the children's market by releasing Aliens action figures by Kenner to entice kids to be interested in the film as well. Love those Kenner figures, by the way. Send in the Marines! Aliens! Send in the Marines! Space Marines! Aliens! To garner more excitement for the film's release, there was an Alien 3 joystick by Cheetah. Three issues for a movie comic and a novelization. There was also a Sega Genesis side-scrolling game, which would be followed up a year later by Nintendo, Game Boy, and the release of the best version, in my opinion, the Super Nintendo. The final tie-in was the 1992 Star Pick Alien trading cards. These were very revealing for their time, as they covered the entire assembly cut with 11 pictures not in the film, and verifying the novel's take on the movie. So, for those who were familiar with these cards or the novel, the assembly footage that would be seen 11 years later was no secret. The cards would also show scenes that are yet to be released. Slated for a May release, Alien 3 entered a dull month with duds like Folks, Poison Ivy, and Criss Cross in theaters. There were also cool duds like Split Second with Rudger Hauer, One False Move with Bill Paxton, and K2, but for about a month, no movies made over $20 million. Another dud called The Water Dance came out on May 15, 1992, but along with this film came the highly anticipated Lethal Weapon 3, igniting the summer season. On May 22, 1992, several movies entered the fray hoping to dethrone the Mel Gibson Danny Glover action fest. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman's epic Far and Away would fail, and so would Polly Shore's Encino Man. The hope was that Alien 3 would win the day, but as you know, it failed in America with a disappointing 55.4 million domestic draw. Internationally, it did better with 104.3 million, making it reach a total of 159.8. Alien 3 would be drowned out of most American theaters within four weeks by movies such as Patriot Games, House Sitter, Sister Act, and finally, Batman Returns. Right at the start of the movie, the tone is outright dread, as the Fox logo is warped into a twisted tone, and it lands with a thud as the credits begin to prepare the audience for the coming death of everyone. This mirrors the doomed production of the film, as David Fincher's goal was to make the tone relentlessly grim, there is no hope, no silver lining, only palpable dread. The movie oozes its atmosphere, but despite the effective tone, there are two major problems that reveal themselves within the first few seconds of the film. The first is, where the hell did the egg come from? Now I want you to note the egg is on the ceiling and hanging in an area that is brightly lit with a white backdrop, suggesting living quarters like a locker area. But in the Blu-ray menu, it zooms in on the Sulaco landing strut while the egg is showing, suggesting retroactively 
where the queen may have placed this egg. However, a landing strut would not be brightly lit inside, nor would the interior of the entire dropship itself. So the idea really doesn't mesh with what we've seen already in the films. Now there are many theories out there about how the egg or eggs existed, so let's just take a look at just three, and there are more to find. The first is, somehow an alien got on board with the queen, and after time, it morphed into an egg after dying, or an egg was planted on the outside of the Sulaco by a drone while Bishop was waiting for Ripley in Aliens. Theory number two states the queen laid an egg while hitching a ride on the Sulaco before being ejected from the ship. The only place this was possible was the landing strut of the dropship. Some propose that while Ripley was in the hive at the end of Aliens, Bishop commandeered an egg somehow and hid it. None of these theories are conclusive and not all of them are even practical. If you want to find the truth, don't expect any objective facts. Even David Fincher didn't have an answer. When he was cornered in an interview about the egg plot hole, he said, It is just something the audience just has to accept in order for the story to move along. This whole problem could have been avoided had the idiots Geiler and Hill just copied William Gibson's premise in his script with an egg birthing out of genetic material deposited by the Queen and Bishop, which was at least plausible and like the Gibson screenplay, Bishop could have survived the event. I don't see why they couldn't have done this since they stole from everyone else, and it seems a logical way to continue the series. What is more confusing is the number of facehuggers suggested by this film. When we start, we see a facehugger cracking Newt's glass, then getting cut, and this starts the fire. In the Alien 3 novel by Alan Dean Foster, it stated the facehugger died from said cut. Within a few seconds of this shot, you can see a scan showing a facehugger on someone, presumably Ripley, at the start of the fire announcement. Stasis interrupted. Now, assuming an alien was wounded rather than killed, it could not jump on a human body immediately as Ripley or Newt's body would have acid wounds as a result. So, in a nutshell, this is what the film proposes. A facehugger cracked Newt's glass, got cut, started a fire before the acid oxidized, and within minutes went to Ripley's tube broke it, got on her face, didn't wound her with acid, planted an alien, and was off before the cryotube was even sent to the EEV to eject the ship. Granted, we don't know the precise timeline, but we do know for a fact that fire travels fast, and it is doubtful that a wounded facehugger could have impregnated Ripley before the cryotube was sent to the EEV. There had to be two facehuggers for this to make sense. Maybe there is three facehuggers, because when we get back on the planet, the dog or ox is impregnated. That is, unless you believe that the royal facehugger can lay two embryos for the queen and a drone to protect it. In that case, there is just the facehugger that started the fire and the royal one that impregnated Ripley and the animal. All this is muddled, to say the least. And Fincher is right, because if you think about it too much, logically, it just doesn't make sense. As I have said in videos before, this is one of those things you will have to make up your own mind as to what you believe. Now we come to the second big problem for this film, and it's a big one. The death of Hicks and Newt. Cameron said it bluntly. I thought the decision to eliminate Newt Hicks and Bishop was dumb. I thought it was a huge slap in the face to fans. Now, if you're a huge fan of Aliens and see it as the best of the franchise, chances are you agree with Cameron's assessment. However, to be respectful of both sides, one must also take into account that there are many who are displeased with the direction Aliens took, and they have little love for Hicks or Newt, or the direction they thought Ripley was taken. There is a good chance some of those people holding said view love Alien 3. 
I love these differing views because they should challenge all of us to think deeper about how and why we look at films the way we do, rather than being unintelligent, spiteful babies who feel offended when someone states a differing concept. In the end, there is nothing I can say to change anyone's perception towards the killing of Newt and Hicks, and I wouldn't try. What I will repeat from earlier videos is that I see the discarding of these characters as a blemish on Sigourney Weaver herself, because she could have ensured their return if she stood her ground for her lesser castmates, but she didn't do that at all. She even touted, You know, how we began the story was one of the most interesting things. Do we keep the sort of family motif going or do we... To me, Ripley's always been a sort of solitary person even though she wants the other thing. I will also note that the drama and depth possibilities of keeping Newt and Hicks alive in such an environment would have been stellar conflict and possibly great storytelling rivaling the earlier Alien films. But instead we got the script that chose the lazy route. For our first deleted scene of the film, we have a face hugger putting a tube down its victim's throat on the Sulaco during the credit sequence. It's creepy and gross, but not necessary. In the theatrical cut, when Newt is seen in her tube, there is some serious confusion about her death as well. Later in the film, Clemens will state this. She drowned in her cryotube. I don't think she was conscious, in this cut, she was clearly conscious and locked in a scream pose. This pose could be explained by the first draft script, where Ripley wakes up in the EEV, goes to Newt, and the girl wakes up as an alien pukes out of her mouth, killing her. Thus, her pose in the EEV fits that script. It also fits with the 1992 comic, as it had a sequence when the Queen Chestburster was a Newt, and as she drowned, it forced its way out of her mouth and entered Ripley. Now, an interesting thing is that the Alien Legacy trading cards of 2003 retroactively backed up this scenario, with card 52 stating Newt had a chest burster in her and that the newborn would flee her dead body and went into Ripley to continue gestation. Now, I don't consider all of the extra things to be canon for the film, but it does add more to support this shot. In the end, I think the idea of an alien baby switching bodies is unbelievable, as it stretches biological concepts that we know in reality. If a fist-sized alien crammed its way into your mouth pushing while you were sleeping unconscious, it's very likely you would not survive. It certainly couldn't find a spot to rest next to your heart, as seen in the film, in such a situation. The alien would go in your stomach or lungs and sit there, and you would most likely feel it there the entire time. There would be no mystery if something was in you. Maybe I'm wrong in overthinking this, which I often do, so give a comment and help me understand where I might be wrong on this possible concept. Now the way I am going to do this retrospective is to go over the assembly cut since it is regarded as the accepted interpretation of the film today. I will treat major theatrical version events as if they are deleted or alternate scenes. To start off, Clemens is walking by himself outside before it gets dark. Early shots establish the character as a loner, isolated, and aware. After finding Ripley, he runs to the facility, and an interesting thing to note is how long a single day is on Fury 161. It turns to night when Ripley arrives in the film. Going outside at this time is brought up. What about outside? Oh, great idea. It's not talking about for another two days. It's 40 below zero. The rescue team's 10 hours away, so that makes a lot of sense. Had Ripley crashed a few hours later, she would have most likely froze to death, so... Not only is the prison an impressively dangerous atmosphere, but the planet itself is as well. Clemens walks into what is called the bug wash room, which is used to wash the insects off material and bodies before entering the main facility. In the bug wash, there are three prisoners, Rains, Martin, and Ed. 
Now, I have to pause and say that in all my film retrospectives, I am very linear, but for this one, I need to focus on the prisoners of this film and how they contribute to the story, if at all. If I went linear without you knowing all of the prisoners, later, you might be wondering what bit player I might be talking about at that time. To curtail this, when we see a prisoner focused on for the first time, I'm going to stop on that prisoner and go into detail about that character, even if they don't add much to the film. I will cover information on the specific prisoner, where you can see them in the film, until their eventual death, so it's easier for those not familiar to understand the many characters this film offers. Main characters like Dylan, Morse, and Gallic will be covered as the movie goes on due to their larger roles. With that stated, one of the most annoying gripes I have ever heard about this film from professional critics is that all the prisoners look the same. They all look the same because such critics don't care to pay attention to details and nuances in performances. I didn't hear this complaint during Full Metal Jacket, or any other similar war movies, and I doubt any private in basic training had a nightmare telling who's who to the level lazy critics had with Alien 3. The real complaint professional critics should have had is that there are just too many characters to keep up with for one viewing. In all, there is said to be 25 prisoners on Fury 161. I could only ever find 22 confirmed prisoners. However, I have no problem assuming that there are three other prisoners doing some odd jobs somewhere else, and we just don't get to see them. Then, they just die during the Kwai Nai Tracetylene scene. With that said, first up is Daniel Rains, life sentence for drug trafficking. Rains was cleaning himself after working outside. Clemens orders him to go with Ed and Martin to locate the EEV. In the theatrical cut, it is Reigns who is complaining to Murphy about his dog barking and tells him to get rid of it. When the meeting with Andrews occur, you can see Reigns standing by his buddy Boggs here. When he eats, he is with his pal Boggs again and complains openly about Gallic. When Reigns checks the candle issue, he is the first to be killed by the adult alien, which is no coincidence since he was the first official prisoner focused on when Clemens arrived in the facility. Fan site states Reigns as a follower, and the scene that I believe supports this the most is when he complains about Gallic. He quickly submits when Dylan pushes back. He speaks under his breath sarcastically, but he doesn't continue to argue. As for Ed and Martin, these are two minor characters who have almost nothing about them and are here just to pad the population. They will be killed unceremoniously in the Kwai Tracetylene explosions. If you are a sci-fi fan and recognize Martin, it's because he's Nick Gillard who was the choreographer for the lightsaber fights in the Star Wars prequels. There are four other inconsequential prisoners in the film who just have cameo shots and then die later as well. The first three are Jani, Lawrence, and Christopher. The better known inconsequential prisoner is Mark Vincent, who was a mass murderer. This character is the one the alien is eating when prisoner Kevin comes up on it. It is noted that Vincent has no other footage in the film except that death scene. I think I found Vincent! In the theatrical cut, there is a scene where the prisoners go into the EEV to find the survivors. The first prisoner that enters is Frank Ellis. Murder. Frank yells at Murphy about his dog, and Reigns follows his lead by berating Murphy as well. Then Frank notes that Ripley is still alive. He is then seen in the assembly cut, bringing the ox babe into the abattoir, and is quite crude about Ripley. Frank is not only lewd, but seemingly thoughtless, because he shows carelessness when he puts the explosive detonator between his teeth after dropping the darn thing. He then climbs the ladder where he meets our eager alien who kills him. Next up is Thomas Murphy, 
Grand Theft Space Vehicle. Murphy responded to the EEV crash and complained about the weather. It is then he is given grief about his pet dog Spike. During rumor control, he is sitting next to Yoshi in the first shot. He also helped Frank bring in the ox and finds the royal facehugger. During the ox scene, Murphy gives off a very bad hygiene vibe as he rubs up against the ox often. In the theatrical version, he continues this trend when he finds his dog Spike and sticks his hands all over the slimy dog's mouth. He just seems like a generally non-hygienic individual. I will also point out that this dog is no doubt covered with bugs on this planet and he seems to be in the minority to be affectionate towards it. He is even singing when he is cleaning out the filthy tunnel where he would eventually die by the spitting alien. An interesting thing in the assembly cut is that you can see a hole in the hull of the EEV where the prisoners are unloading the bodies. This explains how Ripley got out of the escape pod and washed ashore. Another thing to note that is not in the assembly cut is that in the background of Fury 161 in the theatrical version you can see a homage to the Tyrell Corporation building from Blade Runner purposely put into a shot. Now throughout the entire film the next time you watch it look at how Fincher uses the camera angles. Even before the alien is birthed. Fincher forces low shot perspectives so you are constantly seeing the ceilings and upper levels. This is obviously done to remind us that the alien usually comes from above and we as an audience are always forced to look at these areas. This creates a kind of paranoid viewing experience for new time watchers and it pushes the oppressive, threatening, and uncomfortable atmosphere. This brings us to the rumor control meeting in the assembly area. The first prisoner seen is Murphy and Yoshi Troy. Two counts torture and murder to his wife and her lover. Troy is noted as the handyman in the prison. He is at one of the controls of the funeral for Hicks and Newt. In the novel, it is Troy who repairs the turbine in the air shaft after Murphy's death. Troy is also assigned to look for working batteries preceding the fire trap scene. Troy is the one who clears the pistons and get them working before the bait and chase scene. After finishing the piston work, he gives his thumbs up that they are working properly. It is Troy who yelled, Junior, behind you, just before Junior led the beast into the toxic storage room. Had Junior not led the beast, the alien would have most likely killed Troy right there. When everyone assembles in the furnace, Troy is sitting with the others in the back. When the prisoners head to the E-corridors after narrowing the beast's movements, Dylan orders Troy to help the others and he does not hesitate. However, unlike the other prisoners, Troy does not make noise and run through the halls trying to get the beast's attention. Instead, he plays it safe by being slow and quiet, but when he turned a corner, the alien was there anyways. Next up is Leonard Dillon, two counts rape and first degree murder. Dillon begins a prayer for his flock, and this is one of the characters we will cover as we go deeper into the film. As Andrews begins his briefing, Edward Boggs, kidnapping, felonious assault, lights up a cigarette next to his buddy Reigns. He will also shortly be arguing with Dylan over Golic in the mess hall, and he will be the second to die by the adult alien after Reigns. Boggs is a very tough individual and projects it. However, he is loyal enough to help Reigns rather than run away leaving him to die. Then we come to the loud mouth himself, Robert Morse. Five counts armed robbery. Morse is the first to chime in on the dangers of letting Ripley move about the facility, and like Dylan, he will be covered as the video goes on. Now a very disturbing character in this film, once you know his crime, is Eric Buggy. He's a serial killer who abducted and murdered six teenage girls. During the briefing scene, Eric shows instantly how weird he is when everyone is screaming and reacting to the news that the survivor is a woman. 
Eric just stands there, zoned out as if he's in space, and the news doesn't hit him at all. Remember, these prisoners have been living in routine for five years, and this is the first majorly new thing that has occurred. Is a woman. <laughs> I just want to say that I've taken a vow of celibacy that also includes women. And Eric doesn't even respond to it. It's really creepy. Eric is often seen alone in the film, and it ties to the silent, deceptive appearance which led to his cowardly and sinister crimes. In the open, he is quite cowardly, timid, and awkwardly soft-spoken, as you discover throughout the film. Okay. During the tenure of the movie, we learn that he is the cook of Fury 161. During the dining scenes, he can be seen tending to things for his guests. When Ripley comes in, he stands away from her and stares like all the other prisoners. Eric finds Golic after the first encounter while working in the kitchen, and Eric would later work the piston for the mold. I will go into many scenes with Eric later in the film. After Eric prematurely started the piston, he runs into the tunnels and is quickly attacked, and Ripley discovers his body within moments. In the earlier script, Eric was one of the prisoners who would hold up in the abattoir and be killed by Golic. Speaking of Walter Golic, 32 counts murder, 13 counts arson. Golic starts expressing himself in an attempt to join the others in their commotion awkwardly. This scene immediately shows that Golic is weird and lacking social skills. Like Dylan and Morse, we will talk more about him later. Now if you think that every prisoner is just irredeemable characters in this film, you might be right. However, there is a scene that shows a possible softer side. When Ripley, Clemens, and Kevin arrive at the morgue, you can see one of the prisoners put some colorful flowers and a dog tag hanging in respect for the dead laid there. This is a blink and you'll miss it moment, but it is one of those things Fincher did to force depth into the film. With Clemens is his assistant, Kevin Dodd, gang crime and murder. Now. Kevin was the one helping Clemens with Ripley earlier, but since his face wasn't shown, I waited till now to cover him. An interesting thing is that Kevin will later spy on Ripley and Clemens while she asks him if he's attracted to her, and ironically, Andrews suggests later to Clemens that he knows something is going on with the two. It's a good bet that Kevin is the source of this information. Kevin led the alien in the bait and chase scene and yelled at it to chase him after finding it over Vincent. He closed his door and yelled, This thing is really pissed off! In the film, Kevin walked right under the alien. Dylan heard his screams and he pulled him into the mold while Kevin choked on his own blood. The alien then took Kevin when the piston was activated. After the autopsy, when Andrews arrives, note Aaron in this scene. At first, he is just following Andrews, but he shows his character's lack of awareness because the moment Clemens states he's doing an autopsy, Aaron looks down and realizes the body for the first time. You can see how disturbed he is at the sight of the body, and he tries his best to recover his composure quickly for image sake. Now the difference between the assembly cut and the theatrical cut is quite apparent when the ox babe is brought in. I actually prefer the theatrical version with Spike, as it makes sense the alien would be fast and lean if it came from a dog. Either way works for me, but I always wondered if an alien bursted from an ox, would it not be more big and brutish? Moving on, Murphy finds the royal facehugger, and I find it odd that a bigger deal was not made of this find. During the funeral, all of the prisoners were supposed to attend, because in a deleted scene that may or may not have been filmed, some of the prisoners were in the foundry working and talking about Ripley's presence when Dylan walks in and tells them that they are going to the funeral and they are going to respect it. 
An interesting thing that is noted in Rex Pickett's draft is that the prisoners who are loyal to Dylan's religion see the idea of burning the bodies as sacrilegious. They actually believe that in order to be resurrected, your body must exist and therefore the way they dispose of the bodies is actually unacceptable to the prisoners. However, Dylan considers them outsiders, so acquiesce to the idea. The birthing scene is more disturbing for the theatrical cut because the dog was alive. Despite this, the creature that birthed from the dog is very large and didn't look appropriate size-wise. It is only appropriate that we end the video at the funeral of Newt and Hicks. Don't mourn, we will be back within two weeks with the final part of Alien 3. Ain't this Lester Wilson's funeral? Oh ma'am, Lester Wilson was at 9 o'clock. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. Help the channel.